Welcome, fans, to another re ringside reunion. We're here today where uh, this is KNS Promotions in conjunction with RM Video. Um, we're going to be doing a world class ringside reunion. Uh, we're going to be talking about everything from world class to trying to tragedy to DVD, anything you folks want to ask them. I'm going to introduce our three guests right now. First guest, right over here, longtime manager and booker of world class wrestling, Playboy, Gary Hart. Yeah. Yeah. Next to him with a smiling face. <laughs> the, the leader of Devastation Incorporated, the general, Skander Akbar. Oh, Next to him, multi-time tag team champion, Texas champion, Wild Bill Irwin. Right. I'm going to get this thing started right away. Let's enjoy ourselves, answer questions, ask questions, we'll have a good time. Um, for Gary. Yes. Gary, um, tell us about you getting started in world class. Uh, world class, see, there's different periods. It was world class only from 1980 until 87. Before that, it was called uh, Southwest Championship Wrestling. And I first went to Texas in 1966 with Al Costello and Carl Von Bronner. Had a big problem with the promoters, which I usually had. And I left and I returned with Don Jardine, who became the Sparler. And, uh, and then I came back in 76 as the booker and matchmaker TV producer for Southwest Sports. And World Class, I believe, our first shoot was 1980. And it became World Class Championship Wrestling. Okay. Um, you, when did you become booker there? What year was that? Uh, the first time I had the official job as a shooter yeah. would have been 1976. How long did you have that for? Seven years, from 76 to 82. Then I came back from 77 to summer of uh, 70, 88. So all together like 10 years. You know, you, um, last night you did a, with KFM commentary, you did a thing called Guest Booker. Yeah. We spoke about this morning, and you were surprised that the fans were interested in stuff like that. Can you give a little insight to the fans, that they, they hear what a booker is, just give them a little insight exactly what being a booker is. Well, I never considered myself a booker. To me, a booker is a guy that takes a list of good guys and a list of bad guys, and they put them together. I always looked at myself as a matchup. I found talent that the people were interested in, like Bill Irwin, for instance. He came to me, his brother sent me him in what year, Bill? 80. 80. He was what, two years in wrestling? Two. Two years in wrestling. But Bill had something that clicked with the audience. My theory was, if the people recognize you at the top of the ramp, you have a chance. And the further you go down the ramp before they recognize you, the least chance you have. My idea was if the people like them, then I can present them in a way to make them draw me money. My whole thing was I went with who the people like. I wasn't a booker that had my own agenda, that I would push a guy down people's throats and load the undercard to make him look good. Uh, my thing was if you couldn't draw, and the people didn't like you, I didn't bother you. That was my way of doing it. It wasn't the only way, but that was my way. If you caught the eye of the people, then I would feature you. You, you brought up that you uh, you did book uh, Wild Bill over there. Yes. Bill, did he, did he book you for most of your time that you were in World Class? Or were there other bookers that booked you? Uh, most, most, of it, most of it. Ken Mantel came in at the end <clears throat> and did some of it. But uh, Gary, when I came down from, like you said, he, he knew my brother Scott from Atlanta, and I had gone to uh, Calgary for the Hearts, and of course that was 500 mile road trips and baloney skin tires. It was it was crazy. So I had to get out of there, and I think he got me in with Gary. And when, in 1980, when I first came down, it was three and four times a week at first that they were they were running, and within months of getting down there and everybody coming in and all the young talent we were running you know five to seven days a week and everything just went right off 
So were you happy with how Gary booked you? Were you, did you feel you were used properly, or could you have been used better? Or? Oh, you know, you know, you could have put me on top, kid. I could have. You were. I could have been a contender. <laughs> no, everything was, every, he, he, it was fine. Yeah. Could I interject this? Bill, Absolutely. Bill was one of the first guys to really have matches with the Von Erics. Bill was very instrumental in helping develop what world class became, as he said, young guys. And uh, he was very instrumental in the Von Erich boys. Very, very instrumental. So he may be a little shy, but uh, in all honesty, he was one of the few guys that I could put with any Von Erich, even including Mike. And I knew the match would be quality. Yeah, yeah. No, everything always meant I, I have nothing but good memories. You, you had mentioned your brother. Um, when, when his untimely passing, um, how did that affect you, not only personally, but professionally? Because you had a time you guys were a tag team. Well, yeah, you know, but the, we were, I was, uh, there were many years before and after when, you know, I wasn't tagged with him. And he was out as Super Destroyer, he was with Billy, you know, and then I, we were off. You know, the biggest thing was you know, just him, you know, passing uh, was hard. You know, it was hard to be to be around, and it was it was hard to to work with him when he was ill, because I carried most of the match. I mean, you know, no pat on the back for me, but he couldn't, so I had to do most of the work in the ring, and you know that was hard too. But it was uh, obviously harder on him, uh, you know. Uh, but yeah, him passing. Yeah, I don't know how to explain that. But, uh, so I, I didn't have time to get to me then, so I wanted yeah. to see how that went. Um, Scandal, how, how did Devastation Incorporated come about? Oh, well, Devastation came around uh, 1982, and of course, you know, I had a pretty good career when I was wrestling. And then in 1977, uh, I kind of stepped down from doing the managerial thing, and uh, I, I saw the handwriting on the wall early in my career. I uh, yeah, you have to learn how to talk, you have to learn how to interview, and that's a lot of it. So I could always talk, and I always uh, had the good heat. I was always stereotyped. You know, they blamed me for the last 40 years, everything happened in the Middle East. So, you know, it was a, a lucrative thing, and Devastation came along and was passed along to me in 1982. And from then on, and you know, the rest is history. Did you have... Do you have one member of Devastation that was your favorite, or are you just happy with all of them? Hard to say. You know, <laughs> yeah, you put me on the spot here. Uh, you know, they were all great. And Kamala, mm -hmm. his gimmick, we took care of it uh, to the extent that we never ate out. Or, you know, if, if I was conspicuous, everybody would see me, and if they see me, they'll say, yeah, this guy, the big tall black guy with a hat on, well, that must be him. So we never took that chance. And we really, really took care of that gimmick. And then you had the one-man gang. What a man. Uh, they had the missing link. And, and I'm not saying last but not least, but the, 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 uh, the Super Ds were with me. So everything we had, and, and, and Devastation always tried to do profile in as much as, you know, they, they could say, well, that's one of Akbar's men. So I never had a wrestling heel in there. Uh, and there was others that were associated with me, like Ted DiBiase at times and everything. So that's, uh, that's where devastation came in. What the crowd? That's for uh, Scandal and Gary. I was wondering, uh, the Battle of Atlanta, what was it like being on different sides of the Barnett and Uncle? The sides of the Well, I, I had worked for Jim Bardet. Uh, from, uh, I met Jim Barnett in Detroit in 1965 when I was with the student before he became George the Animal Steel. And I uh, made my first trip to uh, Australia in 1968, came very, very close to Jim. Uh, the odd thing about this is when I went to Atlanta for Jim Barnett, at the time I was in Texas managing the Missouri Mauler and Group Bernard. And as a lot of people may know, that. Uh, Missouri Mauler and Jody Hamilton, the assassins, are brothers. So when I left Texas, the Mauler and Drew Bernard left Texas at the same time. I went to Jim Barnett, they went to Ann Gunkel. 
but I had been associated with Jim Barnett, proudly so, who I thought was probably the greatest promoter that I ever had an opportunity to work for. And uh, it wasn't, uh, it was strange because the Mahler and Brute were on the other side, but wrestlers never looked at it like whose side are you on? And we never got into its competition or opposition. It was, they chose to go for the Gunkles and I chose to go for Barnett because of my long association with him in Australia and the Missouri Mauler being a brother of uh, Jody, who was Tom Ernesto's tag team partner. Uh, but there was, no, uh, there was no animosity towards me from them or me towards them. I mean, if we looked at it like, that was best for them to go for the Gunkles, and it was best for me to go with Jim Barnett. <coughs> Did that answer your question? Okay. Stand up. Do you have anything to add to that? Another question you dropped that new Yes. Do you have anything to add to that? Uh, repeat it, please. Oh, you asking for Hank Uncle during the Battle of Atlanta? Very briefly. Yes, yes, I'm sorry I didn't catch your question. Yes, I was there, and uh, uh, the territory was on fire. One Sunday, and we never did anything on Sunday in those days, Tom Renesso called me and we met uh, out on that perimeter 485 at a hotel there in Atlanta, and then they laid out the whole thing that they were going to separate from what it was, and, Ann, and Ray had died earlier that summer. So Ann Gunkel formed her own organization, and I stayed there three or four weeks and uh, I can tell you right now, she treated us very, very well. And at the same time, Atlanta kept uh, running with the old people, Paul Jones. However, uh, I had to come home and uh, I had uh, uh, sickness in the family and everything. So I came back and then went to work for Leroy McGurk. But I was indeed right there when they started. <coughs> started on a Sunday afternoon in a hotel. And Fred Ward, who had Macon in Columbus, Fred had originally say, hey, I'm with you guys, but he didn't. So he switched on over to, uh, uh, and uh, I guess the NWA was furnishing talent on the other side. Yeah. So yes, I was in the Battle of Atlanta. Right? This is from Gary Hart. Gary, yeah. what are your memories of the uh, Great Kabuki? Oh, the Great Kabuki, uh, probably, in the 80s, he was probably one of the first true guys that used martial arts and wrestling together. Uh, I found him to be a guy that uh, was really overlooked for many years. He had been in wrestling, I would say something like 15, 16 years. He had used several different names, but no one really ever gave him a persona that matched him and gave him direction and promoted him the right way. Uh, I remember when I first brought him in, Bill was there, and if you remember the Kabuki, he was about five foot nine, and he might have weighed uh, 215 pounds. And I had found him through Bruiser Brody. I had been looking for this guy that I wanted to make the great Kabuki. And Bruiser Brody told me that there's a guy in Kansas City maybe you should look at. So I flew up with Bruiser, and I saw him, and he was not physically impressive, but I wasn't looking for that. I was looking for someone that combined the martial arts along with catch, catch, can wrestling. And the first, I had built him up three, four weeks on TV, spent a lot of time creating... Showing like videos? Yes. And when he walked into the dressing room, we had all these wrestlers, and they looked at me like, Gary, you've been smoking too much Kichikai. This ain't no chance this guy is going to draw a dime. There was an old wrestling ring announcer by the name of Boyd Pierce, and he came into my office right before we went on TV, and he told me, he said, this is the dumbest thing you've ever been involved in. This guy will not make a dime. But I took him to the ring. He was fabulous, he was made the first night, and everyone wanted the kabuki and they quit laughing. But when he came in that night, everyone's giggling. Oh, look what Gary's got here. This is not going to work. But uh, all the different masks yes, and nunchucks, we spent, a mystery. I spent a lot of money on that. The wig was over $5,000. 
the wooden mask cost $250 a piece. And once I figured out how to do the green, and that was an accident, because I was having him to throw the spider webs that you could get in Japan, and they're very expensive, like 50 bucks a shot. And I was spending a couple hundred a week out of my own pocket to buy the webs for the effect. And my wife was making some cookies, and she knocked over a bottle of food coloring. And I said, aha. And I was lucky enough to figure out a way to mix the food coloring that when you blew it, it would come out as a mist rather than just run down your face. So that was a lot of thought, but I had had the idea of the great Kabuki for many years before I found the right guy and knew exactly how I wanted to present it. And he became a phenomenon. He went back to Japan, uh, did very, very well, and a really a nice guy, a guy that had really never had an opportunity, had been overlooked, was an up and down guy, get someone else over to work in the main event. But in, in his, uh, his defense, he was more or less, give me the money, knock me around. And once I gave him the Kabuki uh, persona, he just took off and did fabulously well. He was very, very good and a really nice guy. I think both of these guys will agree that Kabuki was something really, really awesome special. Character. And he's thanks for asking. I used to go, we used to go, we lived close when I was there, and he was there. We'd go over and uh, he would cook Japanese oh, for he us. Could cook. He, and he made that, made kimchi. You yes. know, it's that cabbage. Oh, and the yoza. Oh, but it was really good. He yeah. The, yeah. He was a great guy. Yeah, he was a good guy. If, yes, um, this one's for both Gary Hart and Skandor Akbar. You had mentioned um, a couple of the big men from world class in Kamala and um, the One Man Gang. But I was also, there's a picture over here of another man I believe both of you men have managed. Um, and I would like your memories on Abdul the Butcher, um, and what you thought of him. Abby yeah. was, uh, mm -hmm. he was unique. Uh, Abby wasn't someone that I felt comfortable with full time. I didn't think it's something that I could feature weekly on TV and in the house shows. So I used him sparingly. Every time I brought him, he would give me a bump in business. But I think the, the bad thing, the bad side of Abdullah, he was very difficult to do business with unless you tricked him, which I did on more than one occasion. Uh, and I tried to bring him in for short bursts, get him established, and then send him out. And then when the time was right, if I had the right guy, uh, someone like Bruiser Brody was perfect, Don Jardine was perfect to wrestle him, and I would bring him in, and he always did very, very well. I was very, I liked him a lot. Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, you know, Abby was all, uh, he was, uh, he was unique all right, in as uh, in as much as uh, uh, the guys, uh, we, we've had so many personalities, and. Uh, in, the, in the wrestling business, but the ones that really, you know, come to the fore, they're the ones that people remember, more or less. So, yeah, I, I agree with you on uh, Abby. But he's still wrestling, so he's got something to offer, you know? I mean, people still want to see him. Billy, your, your thoughts on the sportorium? <laughs> it was hot! <laughs> it was so damn hot! <coughs> Jeez, I remember going there. I remember the first time going down there. Gary gets me, you know, I'm coming down. And <clears throat> we come into it, into Dallas, and then we're trying to find the sportatorium. It's down on Industrial Avenue. Where in the hell is this place? And you're looking for this, you know, the sportatorium. You're looking for this big fancy building, and you come around the corner, and you see the word spray painted almost on the side of it. Sportatorium, and it's a corrugated tin building, and it's like, oh. You go in there, and it was it was perfect for wrestling. It really was. It was perfect. It was a pit, and I found out later that half of it burned or something, and they didn't rebuild it because it was too close to the river, but they still had the ring. It was a pit down to the ring, and once you got in there, you know, it, it became just something that you kind of fell in love with. You won't even, I don't think you can see that building anywhere anymore, you know, the, the the, everything was built into the building, and then underneath the stands was where the you know the corridors were, where you could buy your stuff. And it was a it was a perfect building for wrestling. They had the little place upstairs where we could uh, <laughs> that we could go sit and watch the matches. The guys could get up, and it was dark and everything. 
and every after your match you could always get a beer and we always threw the beer on top of the <laughs> this hanging ceiling and God, it must have been just loaded down with beer cans and I don't know what all up there and the place was full of rats oh jeez I mean you didn't see the rats when everybody was there but believe me they were all over the place because you're right by this river well, I think it was a river. A it was slew, a stream. A stream. A stream. And that was, you know, it, we weren't in the best part of town. It was not in the best part of town. But on Friday nights or Saturday night, because it did switch from eh, different years, it would go from Saturday to Sunday and whatever, and Friday nights. But uh, it was, I went back there about two years ago. I was going through Atlanta. I drove right down there, wanted to go see the sport of time, and it was gone. And it was like, oh man, you know, that place, it, it held a special place in my heart. It was an unbelievable place. It was great.